Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. And I remember I shared my testimony Friday night, how the Lord had brought me out of depression and suicidal thoughts and saved me. And everything was joy and life and peace and victory because the Lord meets you in such a wonderful way way when you're in such a situation of life and many of you in this room can testify of that how God brought you out but one morning I woke up and not everything was the same the joy was missing and I was troubled and I says what's going on here and I was just a young Christian I didn't have necessarily the fellowship that you brethren have here where you can meet on Friday nights Wednesday nights I just had a Sunday morning service that I was going to down at a local church and I, I longed for that Christian fellowship. Mm -hmm. That's why you need to treasure what you've got here in this place because yeah. it's precious. Amen. Take opportunity to be together, fellowship with one another. But anyway, I woke up that morning and uh, I'd, I was always reading the Word of God. I mean, it would just become so precious to me, the Bible. I just would, wouldn't read anything else, I just read the scriptures, I left all of the Christian books to one side, not necessarily that they were wrong, it's just that I knew I had to put within me the Word of God, I had to know the Bible, and I knew that that was God speaking to my life, yeah. and that it was vitally important that I spent time in that Word, and so I, every day I just read chapters and chapters and chapters and mm. just devour the Word of God and some of the stories from Sunday school that I remember growing up uh, they become real I'd be reading <coughs> Daniel and Lion's Den and I say that, that's, I, I learned about that in Sunday school <laughs> that's where it is in the scripture nowhere in the flood and I say oh yeah that's where it is yeah, 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 yeah. it's wonderful to read the scriptures during those days because all those stories I'd learned as a child became a reality to me yes. now uh, because I found them in the Bible and some parts of the Bible were really difficult to understand and I don't claim to have a hold of them now I mean I read through some of those major prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah and when you go over into the minor ones and I'm thinking Lord I, I, I don't know I don't know what you mean but I know that if I walk with you yes. in the right time you Amen. can make me understand what you're saying here in this scripture mm. so I believe that's the way it is. This is a relationship. Yeah. It's between you and the living God. But I woke up that morning, the joy was not there, and I was struggling. I was thinking, what's going on? Have I done something wrong? And I started to walk down to town. I was living in Manchester at the time, and it was about three miles walk from where I was down to town. I was working part-time in a coffee shop where I was washing the dishes in the back. And as I walked down to town, I says, I'm not going to let this defeat me. Yeah. Because it was all Amen. those feelings back, you know, that I was just down. I was deflated. You know, the joy that I'd been experienced was just not there. And I says, Lord, well, I don't understand this, but I'm going to praise you anyway. <coughs> I was walking yeah. across those fields and I just lifted up my hands. Hallelujah. And I started to worship the Lord and Jesus. glorify his name and yeah. just praise him. And you know, it all came back. Amen. But I want to encourage you because sometimes that feeling may not be there. Mm. But that does not change who Amen. God is. Yes. Yes. And He is light. He is life. He's power, peace. He's victory. He's everything you need. And if you get your eyes off yourself and get it back on Christ yes. and exalt Him, then you'll find that He'll position you right back Jesus. where you were. Just focus on Him. Keep your eyes focused on Him. There can come days, difficult days, when you're faced by the circumstances of life and everything seems to be a mess and nothing seems to be going right. You're saying, where is God in the midst of it all? Well, God's right there. Amen. And He's watching every action that we take. Yeah. And He's looking for you to make the right response in you. Jeez. It's not our circumstances that matter. It's the attitude of our hearts. Yeah. And if you have that attitude right before the Lord <laughs> Jesus Christ, then He's able to lift you up into a realm where you'll have victory over the circumstances that you may be facing in your life. Mm. I do appreciate your prayers uh, for the work, for those of you who are praying for the work there in Africa. Uh, most of you know that we run schools over there that are called the School of Christ. And there's a great need over there in the countries that we visit. We have pastors coming to the school, 
have very little biblical training, uh, teach all kinds of funny doctrines in the church, and mm. they just come in there. And I'll just share with you briefly. I was running the School of Christ in South Sudan at the beginning of the year in January, but we had. Uh, I think, I want to say it was above 30 students. I can't remember exact how many it was. But I got pastors in the room, never prayed. I mean, we see, you know the school of Christ. You have mm -hmm. one hour of prayer in the morning, and when you go through the Word of God all day long, and then one hour of prayer in the evening. Well, for three days, there was a big proportion of that class that just sat there and watched us pray <laughs> and I was thinking Lord help us here <laughs> these people don't know how to pray what we're gonna do you know but by that fourth day it just all fell into place Amen. God started to work within the hearts there came a contrition a brokenness a desire to pray they actually made the effort you know people go out there looking for books on how to pray and I learned a while ago that the best way to learn to pray is by you praying. Yeah. Just get in there and just see God. Amen. Yeah. You know, may not have anything to say. You may run out of words. It's okay. Be still. Know that He is God. Mm. It's alright to sit before Him. He's God Almighty. Mm. You know, sometimes you be stillness. You run out of words. And other times you've got words to say. Whatever it is. But have that attitude of heart. Set aside some time each day to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Read the Word of God. You'll find that you'll set Him the priority in your life, and everything else will fall into place. Amen. Mm, amen. Let us pray. Jesus. Heavenly Father, we do come to you this morning. Yes, Lord. And we do ask for your help. Savior. Savior. We ask for your Word. My Lord. Father God, we just are helpless this day. We ask, Lord, for your words proceed yes, <coughs> Speak to our hearts and lives Jesus. and minister to every soul in this place. Amen. Lord, we ask for your unction and your ability, Lord, to speak the very oracles of God. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. I want us to turn in our Bibles, those of you who have got it, into John chapter 8. And there's a well-known story here within the scripture about our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, I wasn't intending to read it all, but we're going to read it all. It's not a bad thing to read the Bible, so we're going to go ahead and read from verse 1. John chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again unto the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, mm. and when they set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground, and as though he had heard them not. Verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted, by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none, but the woman, he said unto her, unto her woman, Where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Mm. Here we have a story, a lady, in his, a lady is took in the <clears throat> act of adultery, and according to the law of Moses, she should have been stoned to death for the action. Notice the man's nowhere to be found, they just mm. pinpointed the woman. Whoever the man was, we don't know, but this lady here, 
is in desperate need of forgiveness. She needs salvation. Mm. The Pharisees are there all ready to throw the stones at her, condemn her, kill her, give her no chance of repentance, send her to a lost eternity. And Jesus writing on the ground and they said, you know, what do you think, Lord? You know, the Moses tells us to stone this woman. And he says, what do you think? And he says, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And it tells us there in verse 9, that they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest. And Jesus says to the lady, woman, where are thine accusers? And she said, well, there's no man here, Lord, anymore. And he says, uh, he says to her, he says, I don't condemn thee. Now you go and don't sin anymore. Mm. Purpose of the gospel is always to bring deliverance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is God's express will for Jesus. you and I. It is to Amen. deliver us from the power and the bondage mm -hmm. of sin. Mm -hmm. We know sin is that which separates us from God. That can be... Sin can come under many names. We use them very glibly in the scriptures. Fornication, adultery, thieving, stealing, murdering, lying, cheating. Those are sins, okay? But sin is that which separates us from the living God. And so we have to be careful in our lives that we don't allow sin within us and that we always keep that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ pure. But here there is a bunch of Pharisees, they are religious teachers of the law, they are well trained in the scriptures, mm -hmm. they have studied, they've memorized a large proportion of the Old Testament and the prophets, they are very familiar with the law of God and they come in this poor moment in time and Jesus says to them, he that is without sin among you, let him be the first one to cast stones. And they all left the situation because the Bible says they were convicted in their own conscience. Yeah, amen. This morning I would like to speak to you for a short period of time about our conscience. If you go to the dictionary and you was looking for a definition, I've got it written down here, of Webster's Dictionary definition of the word conscience, and I'd like to read this to you. But uh, if we can try to define conscience this morning and how it works within our lives. Webster said this, It is the internal judgment of right and wrong. It is a faculty or the power or principle within us mm. which decides upon the lawfulness or unlawfulness of our own actions and affections and it instantly approves or condemns what you are thinking about or what you are acting upon. Mm -hmm. Now that may have gone over your heads. I'm not a very good listener sometimes. And some things people say just kind of goes over. But we're going to define the whole message here on conscience. And we're going to bring it out very clearly. So Amen. don't worry if you just missed all that I just said. Uh, we've all been born. We're in this world. You and I have been born the first time in a body. Mm. We're born of flesh and blood. We all have mothers. We all have fathers. Uh, and because we're born into this world, this world is under condemnation. It's a sinful world. We're living under in a sinful society. And so the way that you are brought up uh, and the way your lives are molded and affected can be affected by a myriad or many different situations yeah. can affect the way you've been brought up. For example, how your parents brought you up is going to affect you as a child, as a young person, and maybe the absence of parents is also going to affect the way that you grow up. It, mm -hmm. it affects all of us, the way our parents have instructed us or our parents have not instructed us, the way our school teachers have taught us, the way the school system is, the peer pressure that we face from other fellow school pupils. Those things affect us. They mold us. They, they, they form who we are. Amen. The environment we're in, Amen. but also who we are personally. No man is created the same. Each one of us is an individual person with an individual personality. There is a living person inside this flesh and blood body. 
and you have a living personality as well. The culture we live in affects our understanding of what is classed as right and wrong. Mm -hmm. If you live in a society that encourages lying, then you find that there is a propensity to approve yeah. of the lying mm -hmm. in the society that you dwell in. If you live in a society that encourages stealing or sexual deviancy, as you find out here in the world today, the propagation of homosexuality, you find the young people uh, say, uh, question who they are. Mm. What am I? I'm a male, a female? What, yeah, yeah. what is it? You know, is this right, this homosexuality? Is these things right? But because society <laughs> has created, said that these things are normal, mm. therefore people are questioning they're asking, and so we see that their lives are being molded in a situation of a sinful world. Children often get their values from other children at school. Mm -hmm. We find that even in the political sphere, strong, assertive leaders mm -hmm. can affect judgments on what is right and wrong. Muslim religious leaders can affect people by their rhetoric and their dangerous talk mm -hmm. and their propaganda, and it affects people's lives, the way people are brought up in those societies, in those cultures, in those religious backgrounds forms the person that they are as they got older. Once ideas have been placed within our minds, then conscience works within us, convinced of the ideas, and it compels you now to live in accordance with those ideals, whether they be right or whether they be wrong, because conscience can be affected also in an evil way. Yes. So the conscience manifests itself in a feeling or an obligation to do what we believe is right. It is a process of working in us before we act and it follows our actions in either approving or disapproving what we have done. Conscious works in letting us know what our duty is in everyday life. And once we have done our duty, then it judges our actions that we have performed. Maybe you brought up in a household and your mother and father made sure you made that bed every single day of your life. Mm. And you grew up to be an adult and you know you leave that bed untidy and you come out of that bedroom and that conscience is saying you left that bed untidy. <laughs> that's because you've been in an environment that's encouraged and strengthened yeah, that yeah, area yeah. of your conscience in that way. Some people have not had that teaching, so they just say, well, it doesn't matter to me. That's because the conscience has not been changed, tra uh, trained to approve or disapprove the action that you've faced. I want us to go further at this point and make a clear difference between conscience working in an unsaved individual and conscience working in a saved person who's walking in fellowship with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, well-known scripture there, you can just write it down and look at it later. It tells us that if any man be in Christ, yeah. the Bible says he is a new creation. Amen. All things have passed away. Yes. Behold, all things become new. Yes. When you get born again, God wipes the slate clean. Hallelujah. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions Jesus. from us. He's dealt with our sin because of the cross of Calvary. You are constituted anew. You've been saved by the blood of mm, Jesus. Yes. Now there is a new slate. Hallelujah. It's like God's took the black on the blackboard and he's took the eraser and he's just wiped off all of your past Amen. in a moment of time. He says, okay, this is a fresh start here for this individual. I want him now to write upon his law, upon his mind, yes. my laws, my word, my truth. Jesus. And so the conscience is now made innocent. You've been washed been purified, made clean yeah. by the blood of Jesus. And now God's writing upon that heart and law, mm. His own very word, His laws. 
and conscience is being enabled to now approve of the things that are now excellent and true and good and holy. Amen. It is no longer a matter of you being an unsaved person and conscience is not sure of what is to approve, whether this is the right action or wrong action, but now you are born again, the Holy Spirit works upon the conscience to direct your life in accordance with the Word of God. And so instinctively, like an animal that knows the direction to travel when mm -hmm. it's going home to where it's roosting or wherever it is, the animal instinctively knows. So you now as a born again Christian have this instinctive notion inside of you of what is right and wrong. Amen. It's incredible. Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit working in the conscience, yes. bringing light to our actions, yeah, telling us the directions to go in, what not to do, what to do. He's directing our steps, and God now uses the conscience to approve of those things that are right mm. and disapprove now of those things that are wrong. Yeah. I remember as a young Christian, I was working in the country of Wales and uh, we had a health and safety officer that was over the work and I was carrying a heavy bunch of equipment and he was sincerely trying to help me and he says look legally you're carrying too much weight and I just wanted to get a job done I wanted to finish for the night I wanted to get on out of the workplace <laughs> get back to where I was staying and not have to worry about it and I knew that if I if I had to carry this piece of equipment, if he wanted me to split this up, that means I have to go back and forth two times. So I just said something smart to him. I just picked it up and I just, I huffed it over there and put it back, you know. But I went home that night and God started dealing with this conscience of mine and says, you did wrong. You did not obey the authority that was over you. Amen. He gave you an instruction. He's seniority to yeah. you. You should have obeyed what he said. Amen. Instead, I just you know, kind of said something smart, glanced smart, left and went on my way and went home. But that conscience was dealing with me. You know what I had to do? I had to turn around, walk all the way back mm -hmm. and go up to him and says, look, I'm sorry. I did wrong in this situation. I, I, should, have, I should have done what you told me to do. Yeah. Please ask for your forgiveness in, in me. It won't happen again. I'll try to do what's right next time. But that's the working of conscience yes. within yeah. side of us. It will cause you to backtrack and say, hey, I did something wrong there. I need to go rectify that. I need to make that right, my brother and my sister. I need to do the right thing in this situation. You, you know, you kind of done a job partially done. I go on down, I threw something to one side and I go on down the road and I say, I need to go take care of that and I have to mm. come back. Do the thing right the first time yeah, and you'll save yeah. yourself great plot <laughs> trouble and time later on. So the conscience manifests itself in feeling an obligation to do that which is right. So we just said we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are now in light. You are in truth. And because you are in the light... You want to make sure that your life is transparent before God. Yeah. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and verse 15, Peter talks to us and says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. So he says, not according to your former life, but as he which have called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Amen. And then we go on into verse 23 and verse 24. It tells us that we've been born again, not of corruptible seed, not according to the life of the flesh, but of that incorruptible seed by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And so now, as newborn babes in Christ Jesus, he tells us to desire sincerely the milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if you so have tasted that the Lord 
is gracious. Mm. It is important as new Christians and even as we are maybe a bit more mature and we've gone on the Christian faith that we feed ourselves on the Word of God. Yeah. Don't feed yourself on spiritual junk food. Yeah. There's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of things in the Christian world and none of them are without signification. Yeah. We have to be careful what we're listening to, yeah. what we're paying attention to yeah. and what we're reading. Yeah. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of Jesus. the Word of God. Yeah. As we study God's Word, you'll find that your standards are brought in line with God's thoughts. Yeah. If all you do all day is sit down and watch the TV, that is going to be your standard. Yeah. If all you do is read newspapers, then that is what your standards become set upon. Yeah. If all you do even is just read Christian books or novels and you do not read the Bible, then that is what becomes your standard. Amen. I enjoy reading history. I, I've, I've been catching up on my education. But I'm the first one to admit, I'm not a historian, but I've been trying to piece together the history of our world and how things fit together. But there is no power, there's no moral efficacy yeah, yeah, in me yeah. reading history. Yeah, yeah. There's no power in studying economics or politics, or those these may be Amen. helpful in our lives. <laughs> these subjects are good, it's good to be aware of what's going on in our daily life, but there is no moral efficacy to these things. The Bible declares that God upholds all things by the word of His power. Yes. Yeah, that yeah. is Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It also declares that we have a more sure word of prophecy. That is 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. His word the Bible has power and it has authority. Amen. And so when God told to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it says for him to meditate upon the law of the Lord night and day. Amen. Psalm 119 and verse 11. David the psalmist or the psalmist says there, Thy word have I hid in my heart, yes. that I might not sin against thee. Mm. How vitally it is important. Yeah. The word of God is better than history, than politics, yes. than the news, than the latest movie. Yes. It has the power to affect men's destinies and change Amen. the course of nations. Yeah. That is why Paul told Timothy to preach yes. the word. Amen. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, mm -hmm. exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Yeah. It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 that you are to study, yeah. to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. But shun profane and vain babblings, for mm -hmm. they will increase unto more ungodliness. Have you ever heard any vain babblings? Have you ever heard any fables and unfoolish stories? They do not help you in your Christian walk. Be centered in the Word of God. It is a foundation for our lives. Some people in Christianity have the strangest ideas that have no biblical reference whatsoever. Yeah. And you know why? Because they don't read the Bible. Yeah, amen. Read the Word of God. Yeah. Be centered on that. And all of that foolishness will disappear. Right. I rejoice in the simplicity yeah. there is in the Lord Jesus amen. Christ. Amen. Paul wrote and he says, I fear lest Satan have begun guiled you from the simplicity mm. there is in the Lord right. Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen. Don't get caught up in the modern doctrines. Yeah. If it's new, it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> if it's true, it's not new. Amen. There's no such thing as a new revelation. Mm. God doesn't reveal new truth. He reveals the old truth yes. to a new man. Yes. It's new to me, yeah. but it's contained within the Word of yes. God. And so God always 
always speaks in line with his word. He doesn't bring out, he doesn't add to the word of God, neither does he take away. If Jesus was here today and you asked him a question and says, what must I do about this? He said, well, let's look in the Bible to what I've already spoken. Every answer to your life is contained within this book. Yeah. Study it. Read it. Find out what God is saying here. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Yes. It is profitable mm -hmm. for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But today, this is not a message or a discourse about the Bible. I want us to speak about conscience. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, <laughs> that you may prove what is that good and acceptable mm. and perfect will of God. Now where our culture goes contrary to the word of God, then the mind has to be renewed and brought into obedience to God's will. Let us take this further. Over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 5, the Apostle Paul tells us to cast down imaginations. Mm. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Jesus. John Wesley, a great revival preacher of history, said this about this particular verse. He says, destroying all vain reasonings, every high thing that exalts itself. You know, self wishes to exalt itself yeah. above God. That must be put down. That's a vain thing. Bringing every thought, or rather faculty of the mind, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Those evil reasonings that come into your mind must be destroyed. The mind itself, being overcome and taken captive, lays down all authority of its own and must give itself up to perform for the time to come obedience to Christ who is the conqueror and the obedience of faith. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, I want us to talk a few minutes about how the conscience can be molded in our lives. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. And we're going to read through to verse 19. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. I was reading earlier on just in 2 Thessalonians, I think it was chapter 2 and verse 9, and it talked about those who did not receive the love of the truth yeah. that they might be saved. If one thing I can encourage you this morning is have a love for truth. Yes. Yes. Possess within your heart, I want to love truth. Amen. I want to love the truth, even if it offends me, even if it hurts me. I want to have a heart attitude that says, that's the truth, and I'll bow myself before it. And I'll acknowledge, yes, I've been wrong, but God is right, and His Word is true. So even in this morning, as we come over these items revealed here in Proverbs, love the truth. Don't despise it. Listen to what the Bible has to say. The first thing that God hates in this passage is a proud look. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Mm. Pride can be seen in many ways, but ultimately it is self-exaltation. I know I travel a lot of places, but everywhere I go I see a vast assertion of selfishness within our days. Pride is selfishness. 
We have many people exerting themselves, promoting themselves. Everything is about themselves. Even in conversation, self comes out too many times in all of us. Yeah. We're all guilty of this. How many posters, advertisements you see of men, oh, this wonderful Hollywood star, movie star, singer. It is all an exaltation of yeah, self. Amen. It is pride. It is ungodly ambition, yes. envy, the desire to be seen and recognized. Jesus said to us, unless a man humbles himself and becomes like a little child, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. There's no place in that kingdom for the proud individual. Amen. Whatever it is that we may hold dear to our hearts must be cast aside. We must humble ourselves to come before the kingdom of God. Amen. How do you recognize a kingdom? Well, wherever there is a king, yeah. there has to be a kingdom. Amen. And wherever King Jesus is, there the kingdom of yes. God is. Yeah. If yeah. I will follow King Jesus, I can guarantee I'm in the kingdom Amen. of God. Yeah. The second thing that the Lord hates is a lying tongue. Do you know, do you understand that God hates lying, yeah. deceit? Lips that are full of guile. Yeah. The Lord Jesus, when he saw Nathaniel, there he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. A man in whom there is no guile. That is a man who speaks the truth. There's no cunning, there's no craftiness coming out of his lips. Jesus told us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Lying lips come from a lying heart. The scripture tells us that the devil is the father of lies. So if a person lies, then he's walking in the devil's footsteps. Yeah, Jesus said to us, I am the truth. Christians are people of truth. They're people of honesty. They are people of an integrity. They're not deceitful. They're not using a cloak to hide whatever is going on. They're not deceitful. They are not yeah. lying. Amen. Then the third thing is that the Lord hates is hands that shed innocent blood. That is people that kill innocent people. I know over the past few decades since the High Court Supreme Court decision in America where they overruled Roe versus Wade and abortion became a legal practice. How many millions of babies have been Amen. slaughtered at the hand of ungodly doctors? Innocent blood that has been shed by the hands of men and women across the world. Adolf Hitler, that wicked ruler of the German Empire, may be called merciful and have compassion in comparison to the slaughter of unborn babies across the world. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. But the fourth thing that is stated here, there is a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. It is a bad man who lies on his bed thinking at night about how he can be deceitful and cheat people. Right. You know, my brother here, Dale, he comes from Nigeria, and I've been in Nigeria, and Brother Dale will understand when I say this, but on the side of the houses in Nigeria, you have this writing, it says, Beware of 419. Is that right, brother? It says, Beware of 419. And I go there, all the houses are there, Beware of 419. What does 419 mean? Well, it's a person that's lying on his bed thinking wicked imaginations. It is premeditated wickedness. It is imagining how I can steal a house from somebody else that belongs to them. That's what they do. They sell the house underneath a person who's living in it. So they write on the side of the wall, beware of 419. I don't know whatever 419 is, but I presume it's a court order or some kind of law that says you can't do this. But that is a man, somebody, a man or woman laying on the bed thinking, imagining evil, wicked imaginations and saying, how can I steal these houses from people? God hates here 
The feet that be swift in running to mischief. I think we understand that. I know as a young man we was over in the playground and somebody would get a fight going in the fist cuff fight and everyone starts saying fight, fight, fight and everybody's running from all over the place. Everyone wanted to see a good fist fight. Well, maybe that was feet that are swift in running to mischief. All wanting to find out what's going on, what's happening, what's the fight going on. Looking, where's the wickedness going on today? Let's go find out all the trouble that's happening. Swift to do mischief. And then finally, last two things here. He says he hates a false witness that speak of lives. Yes. Brethren, how important it is that our testimony be before the people of this world. We say confidently, yes, we are Christians. But it's not what a man says with his lips that determines and distinguishes him by what he is. It is what you do. It is known by the actions yes. of your life, Amen. whether you love the Lord Jesus Christ or not. It's easy to come here on a Sunday morning. We all say praise the Lord. We sing the songs of Zion. And it's great to have this environment. But when I leave out here on Monday morning, I have to be an embodiment yes. of what I brought here on yes. Sunday. Amen. I cannot drink dress this up Sunday Amen. morning and then leave out of here and live something different on Monday. I have to be what I am every day yes. of the week. And finally, thank you Nathaniel, God hates a person who sows discord among brethren. We understand what that is. That is gossiping, speaking bad of other people behind their backs, whisperers, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15, Paul warns and says, If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Yeah. All these things as a Christian need to be awakened and made very vivid in our conscience. Don't allow cultural tradition to stop the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to your conscience, to do that which is right yeah. in accordance with His Word. Amen. Let us hear the word of exhortation in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19, where Paul says, holding faith and a good conscience, yes. which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. If a man is drowning in the lake, wherever that is, maybe it's in the Shannon River or whatever, and a man throws him a lifesaver, a buoyancy, something that will help him float, that man, if he's truly desirous of living, is going to hold on to that lifesaver mm. with everything that is within him. Paul tells us to hold to faith and a good conscience. Don't allow it to be destroyed mm. because there are some who have put away faith and a good conscience and have made shipwreck. Then he mentions two men. One is called Hymenus and the other Alexander, whom Paul says that he delivered unto Satan that they would learn not to blaspheme. Yes. Now according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, Hymenus, it appears, denied the resurrection. And he turned from truth to error, and he overthrew the faith of some of the believers by his erroneous teaching. It says their word will eat as of a canker, of whom is Hymenus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrown the faith of some. Alexander could possibly be the same man as Alexander the coppersmith, who did Paul great evil, as stated in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Whoever these men were, whatever they were, is, Paul says they put away faith and a good conscience. Yeah. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, it talks about some people who speak lies in hypocrisy, 
having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Yes. Now if you have ever worked amongst metal and you've ever heated metal up, you know that as you heat that metal up, if it ever touches your skin, maybe some of you ladies or some of you guys in there, single men, and you've worked in the kitchen, you've been across that hot burner and that metal seared your mm. skin and left an indelible mark that's there for the rest of your life. Mm. You are scarred for the rest of your earthly life. Yeah. Well, here it is. Paul is telling us that some speaking lies in hypocrisy have their conscience seared with a hot iron. Mm -hmm. How vitally and important it is that we be the people of truth, yeah, that we maintain yeah. a good conscience in the sight of God. These are vital areas yes. of our lives. Don't allow lying, deceitfulness, to sear that conscience okay. so that you now justify that which is wrong and you know is wrong. Jesus. Mm. Don't allow that in your mm. heart and mind. Don't justify it. Yeah. It's not allowed. Amen. You must be a person of truth. Stand for what is right. Yeah. Even if it puts me in the worst situation possible, let God be true, yes. but yeah. every man yeah. a liar. Yeah. I remember there has been occasions in my life where as you seek the Lord, God deals very directly with that conscience. Yeah. And I know there have been times as I've saw God in fasting and in prayer that God has brought to my attention something that I have left undone. Amen. And I won't go into things this morning because I don't feel it's appropriate to do that. But let me leave you with a testimony. <clears throat> For those of you that have come from Africa, you know, sometimes the cultural environment over there, it uh, allows you to lie. It's, it's part of sometimes the culture. And sometimes in different countries you visit, it, different things become the normality. But I was over in a country in Africa working with one of the directors there for the School of Christ. And he had told me something the night before. And, he went to bed to sleep, and as he slept that night, I slept that night, he didn't sleep. He came round the first thing in the morning knocking on the door, and he says, uh, my conscience has been bothering me. Uh, I believe I related some wrong information to you last night. Well, when you meet such a person, be thankful. Mm. It's such a blessing yes. to meet somebody whose conscience would be troubled enough to make them turn around and go and make restitution. Don't allow that conscience to become hardened or seared with a hot iron. This brother was an example of what a man of God should be, whose conscience was held captive to the Word of God. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2 that we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, we now commend ourselves to every man's conscience yes. in <clears throat> the sight of God. Yes. Let us pray. Oh, Jesus. Father, we thank you this day. Thank you.